Okay, so welcome everyone to Second Tuesdays with Political Science. Today we're talking about criminal governance in the COVID-19 era. Uh, so thank you to all of our audience members as well as panelists for coming today. I'm just going to quickly introduce our panelists. So today we have Dr. Juan Albarcin is an assistant professor at IC University in Cali, Colombia. His research explores political and criminal violence in several Latin American contexts. We also have Dr. Nick Barnes, who is an assistant professor at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. His work examines urban organized crime and he has conducted extensive field research in Rio de Janeiro favelas. We also have Dr. Cecilia Farfan, who's head of security research programs at the Center for US-Mexican Studies at UC San Diego. Her research explores the business models of organized crime with a specific focus on Mexican criminal organizations. And last but certainly not least, we have Philip Johnson, who's a doctoral candidate at City University um, of New York and a visiting fellow at the Center for US-Mexican Studies at UC San Diego. His dissertation looks at Mexican criminal organizations use of public messaging. Um, so to get started for today, I know many of our audience members may be unfamiliar with the term criminal governance, and it's a term that admittedly even those of us who study this um, often debate what exactly we mean. So to get us started today, I just want to quickly hear from each of our panelists about how they conceptualize criminal governance and allow them to highlight examples from their respective geographic areas of focus. So we'll start off with Juan. Thank you, Laura, for this amazing panel and always it's a pleasure to share ideas and share ideas with friends and, and colleagues who I respect very, very much. Uh, I'm going to start and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a definition of, of criminal governance that has been uh, set forward by um, Benjamin Lessing in a recent piece in Perspectives in Politics, because I think it's very useful to understand what it is and can be and also for our discussion later on it the impact of COVID on, on this form of, of, of governance. In general, you can think about criminal governance. It, it's, it's strange uh, when you think about criminal organizations actually doing and uh, setting, imposing rules and regulating social behavior. Because for the most part, we think about criminal organizations as what they are, they're outside of the, the law and they're operating outside like regular and formal institutions and regulations. But the fact that they're doing this is really interesting and it's quite widespread. So criminal guns in general is again, that's the, the, the imposition of rules and the restriction, the regulation of behavior by a criminal organization. And this can happen in at least three dimensions. And again, this is a work by Lessing that I, uh, I, I Nick, Nick and I have been also using in other uh, discussions. First of all, they can regulate the criminal organization itself. I mean, how members within an organization operate. They can also regulate illicit markets that by definition cannot be regulated by the state. And they can also, and I think this is the most known form of criminal governance because it's the one that gets the most attention in the media. It's when uh, criminal organizations govern or uh, regulate social behavior in communities. I.e., They regulate the behavior of people who are not necessarily, they're not their members. And that's when you start seeing things like the provision of public goods uh, and certain types of uh, regulations that these groups impose on, um, on, on, on communities. So that's like the scope of, of, uh, of phenomenon, uh, phenomena that we can study and we look at when we look at criminal governance, but this is indeed a, an interesting and evolving concept. Thanks, Juan. Um, Nick, if you want to chime in. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Laura, as well, for the invitation. This is it's always a pleasure to talk to all of you. Uh, these are conversations that we a lot of times have in private, so this is basically a normal day for all of us. Um, so I think I think Juan's start to the discussion in differentiating criminal governance between these three dimensions, that is how they govern their own members, that is members of the criminal group, how they govern illicit markets, that could be the drug trade, that could be protection rackets, could be money laundering, it could be a, a ton of different activities. 
Um, and then how they govern communities, people who may have, most of which have nothing to do with the criminal underworld or any illegal activities. Um, the focus of my research is, is on that third one, how they govern communities. So I study Rio de Janeiro's favelas. These are sort of informal and impoverished neighborhoods. And in Rio, of which there are about a thousand of these in Rio, almost all of them are, are governed by one type of criminal organization or another. Um, I look at drug trafficking gangs and how they govern those neighborhoods. And I think of that type of governance as all of the structures and practices through which gangs try to control territory and manage the relationship with the local neighborhood, with all the people that live in that neighborhood. And the way that I think about that is generally it's two different types of activities. The stuff that they give to the community, so they provide welfare in some cases, they throw parties, they build soccer fields in, in certain rare cases, um, they resolve disputes between people, and then on the other hand, the way that they maybe coerce the local population, the way that they try to control them through violence primarily. And that is they control movement in and out of those neighborhoods. They punish people who disobey their rules. Um, and they, they try to shape local behavior more generally. And I think that, you know, that way of thinking about it in that neighborhood, both like the, the carrots and the sticks, so to speak, of how they relate to local popul populations is maybe a, a good way to, to start thinking about that d particular dimension. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I think that um, was really helpful to start having some more examples. Um, I'm now going to turn to Cecilia and then Philip, who can probably give us even more examples um, from Mexico. Um, thank you, Laura. And I, um, you know, as Juan and Nick pointed out, it's great to have this discussion with, you know, fantastic colleagues, but also friends. And as Nick was pointing out, conversations that we uh, constantly have. So thank you again for for the invitation. Um, similar to Nick, uh, I should mention that my work focuses, as you were explaining in introduction, in trying to understand the business models of criminal organizations. So a lot of times when I think about criminal governance, I'm thinking about the strategies that criminal groups, and in particular, for example, in the case of Sinaloa in Mexico, um, they use to regular, regulate the behavior of their members. And this is important because a lot of the times we tend to think that there's a lot of violence involved in the relationship within the group. And really what having this idea of criminal governance allows us to do is to really see that while violence is an option, there are other sets of incentives at play. And so some of these organizations even offer, if you will, uh, incidental benefits packages to their members. And so that regulation of the relationship, it's not always violent. And this is important for us to understand because it also tells us um, how this interaction with law enforcement will be. Should they be captured or should there be, uh, you know, uh, should they come into the territory? The other, um, in thinking about this criminal governance as this set of strategies, it also helps me think about the hub of operations uh, of these groups. And again, this has to do a little bit with how they how they govern communities. But I think what's important here to point out is that we're not necessarily thinking that they're wanting to substitute the state, that they want to replace the state, but rather how we see that they uh, build their own uh, loyalty with these groups, right? And so it's not necessarily just an attachment to a brand, but there is some service provision, as Nick was pointing out, these carrots and sticks uh, at play with the communities. And so in the case of Sinaloa, it really helps us understand why when the army attempted to arrest one of the sons of El Chapo, you had these uh, sort of like the community come out and stop it, right? And it was not just out of a uh, narco idea, but really uh, setting roots in the city and offering benefits uh, that are not available otherwise. So just to sum that up, when I think about criminal governance, I'm thinking again how they regulate that relationship within their own group, that it's not always violent, and also how they regulate uh, the relationship within their hub of operations, which may be different from other locations that are not their hub of operations.
Uh, Philip, if you want to <laughs> chime in. Sure, thank you. Um, so, I mean, these are these are great um, definitions and examples of, of criminal governance. So, I'll, I'll just try and uh, fill in a few gaps around them and then add add some more examples. I think, um, as Cecilia said in in her point, um, the role of the state here can be pretty important. And I think I think sometimes criminal governance can sound as if it means criminal criminal alternative state, right? Or or, or a sort of um, the state being weak or failing and not being able to do its job, so criminals coming in and creating their own uh, shadow state, parallel state, whatever we want to call it. I think you know there's there's some truth that criminal governance involves practices that look like things the state are supposed to do, but I think, at least in the cases I know best, criminal governance is rarely directly antagonistic to the state and very often involves a lot of collusion, corruption, um, at the very least a sort of level of impunity that allows uh, criminal actors to govern without directly sort of, uh, you know, having to overthrow or, or, or challenge the sort of the, fu the function of the straight state, right? I think, um, and that way I think the term can be a bit misleading, right? We, we are talking about um, criminals acting like governments, but we're not talking about criminals that, that fully replace governments necessarily. Um, and in my work, I'm, I'm trying to think about a, a sort of a dimension of governance that doesn't get a lot of attention and that's um, forms of sort of persuasion, propaganda, uh, changing the sort of public discourse, right? And um, criminal actors certainly do that, but it doesn't always get a lot of attention because we sort of don't don't necessarily expect that uh, criminals who are, who are in theory sort of economic actors and are out to make a buck um, to engage in this sort of, uh, you know, uh, work to shift opinion or to to change interpretation and meaning on the ground. Um, but the, so in, in Mexico, I look at the practice of narco messaging, which involves actually displaying physical texts, you know, written words uh, on banners, on bed sheets, on, on scraps of paper and cardboard, um, some very well produced, some very sort of like homemade and, and pretty scrappy. Um, but using those to, to proclaim messages, right, to say, uh, who this criminal actor is, what they're up to, and maybe also how they view the state, whether they're more deferential, whether they're more like aggressive. Um, and I think that's really important because um, when we look at interpretation and, and persuasion, we see that like whether or not a criminal group can control violence isn't just down to whether they can get rid of it or whether they can monopolize it, but it's also a question of whether they can shift how people understand it, right? They can potentially, if you can persuade people, you can turn innocent victims into sort of worthy adversaries, right? And you can turn the victims of violence into people that deserve to die. Um, and that's really important and, and really quite scary because um, it it means that uh, governance and provision of order doesn't always mean uh, non-violence and safety. It can actually mean that um, criminal actors build their legitimacy on the idea that there are people even worse out there that they have to get rid of, right? And they can, they can sort of build their reputation of being the lesser of two evils without being peace-loving uh, good guys. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Um, thank you all. Uh, that I think was super helpful. Um, Juan, thanks for highlighting that, right? When we talk about criminal governance, and a lot of us are drawing from this work by Ben Lessing that Juan noted, um, right, that can really mean three things ranging from governance, right, of their own members, so within group, to of communities, as Nick offered a lot of great examples of, to over markets. Um, thank you, Cecilia and Philip, also for highlighting a lot of common misconceptions about criminal governance, right, that this is not always violent, that, right, these groups aren't often trying to replace or necessarily even challenging um, the state. Um, so now that hopefully we all have at least a, a general understanding of what criminal governance is, I want to shift to thinking about how it's been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so the following questions are open to all panelists. If any of you want to chime in on any of these, and then hopefully we'll still have time at the end for audience questions. So. Uh, first off, if anyone has any thoughts on how criminal organizations adapted their behavior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll hear from Juan first. I can start, get the ball rolling, and I'm sure this is going to, uh, we're all going to chime in. 
Uh, I think I, going back to those three dimensions, you're going to see very different uh, responses depending on what type of governance you're talking about and in what context it's happening and what type of illicit activity most of these groups are related to. So uh, you might see, for example, that um, the COVID crisis generated um, changes in, in a particular illicit market. Let's say a, a group was uh, focused on extortion and uh, if, ex if extortion is your, your, your source of income, then a, a shutdown, for example, can generate a, a tremendous loss of income because there is no production of, of anything, for, for that matter. The, the communities you're ta extracting resources away from, well, they're basically shut down. So for those types of, 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 um, of groups, for example, uh, COVID meant uh, an existential threat to a, a source of income for the one part. But also that threat of this, uh, to their source of income generated a different behavior if they were governing populations and, and communities. So that you could possibly think that these were the first types of groups that were not imposing curfews on their populations or actually hoping that people would go to work or making people go to work because that's what they needed. Uh, so a, a necessity that comes from the illicit market that they particularly ruled generates an impact on the type of uh, uh, behavior they have towards populations. Um, that on the one side, uh, you can also probably think that uh, if some sources of revenue died down, then they start looking for other potential or real um, sources of illicit income. So if I cannot smuggle something, for example, then I will try to find another source, uh, maybe extorting from populations. So you can see other groups shifting around in, in what they're doing. So that is like, uh, like you can start thinking about this. This is a very interesting puzzle. And I, I think um, we are, as social scientists, we're trying to look and see this. How is this happening on the ground? And this is a little difficult because we're also <laughs> locked down <laughs> and we can't do the type of work that we usually do or try to do. Uh, so we're, we're trying to figure out ways in to get to this information. And uh, it, it can be really circumstantial, like for example, uh, a week ago, I went to a, a restaurant I like that sells fish. I'm, I'm really close to the Pacific coast of Colombia, but I'm not on the coast. And the woman who was cooking said, well, you know, uh, fish is more expensive now. Uh, and what's going on? Well, uh, the criminal groups are taking the fish away from the fishermen and asking for a tax. Uh, so like they shifted towards extorting this other form of income, it's, it's it, actually, it's not an illicit market, it, it's, it's fishing, but they've made it so that they're charging for protection or taxing them now that as a, as a way to supplement their income. So uh, that's kind of the dynamics we're seeing and, and that it's, 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 it's a lot of variation. You, you, there's very hard to generalize all of this looks like this. You have to start looking at very specific patterns. I, oh, okay. Um, I was going to say thanks, Juan. I was actually about to pick on you, Cecilia, because I know you've done so much work on the diversification of of criminal organizations. So, yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, no, I'm I'm happy to uh, to jump in, and I think as Juan was pointing out, because we've also been so limited in you know ourselves in actually conducting this this work, it has you know um, we also had to adapt. But I think you know you asked you know how they have adapted their their behavior, and I think in in view of any shock right in this case it was a pandemic but the name of the game in illicit markets it's really to adapt right either you you adapt your strategies to what law enforcement in, is doing or shocks that you face in your market or you will disappear so so we could we knew sorry that's my dog uh he doesn't really like the mailman um we knew there was going to be an ad ad adaptation what we don't know yet is the extent as to you know how they have adapted two things that are coming out and similar to what one was pointing out for example in, in the case of Sinaloa we know that they have been using food delivery services and apps you know sort of like Uber Eats and other ones that exist in Mexico uh, for some time now to also use uh, for um, small drug markets so for consumers uh, in the state and with the pandemic and as food services have increased, what we have seen is, or what it's being reported is that you have more people applying for those so they can also supplement their income 
both within the context of the legal activity that they are doing, but also working for a criminal organization that benefits from the fact that, you know, because our, these services are getting used more right now, they can, you know, disguise this criminal activity. The other thing that I have written about that I think uh, we have lessons from the 2000 nine great recession is that I expect banks to also be more willing to launder proceeds of crime now because they're also um, going to face uh, liquidity uh, concerns. And so what we know from that crisis is that they're more willing to relax some of these compliance measures that they have in place. So I I wouldn't be surprised in, if in a few years we also learn that, that some banks again are facing some of these fines. Uh, for laundering money because what they do is essentially weigh um, the cost against the benefit of, you know, accepting some money that may come from, you know, dubious uh, sources, but having the money uh, with them. And so in that sense, I also think we'll see uh, more money laundering happening in, in financial services. Yeah, Nick, did you want to chime in? Uh, yes, so um, so I had the opportunity over the last couple of weeks to talk to a bunch of people down in Rio in favelas about what had been happening since last year uh, and the pandemic. And, you know, there, I mean, undoubtedly there were a, a, a lot of changes in sort of daily life that occurred within these communities as, you know, movement uh, was restricted. Um, there is quite a bit of mask wearing, but apparently there's there's not as much as there was maybe early on in the pandemic. So they, they sort of broke down the pandemic into different periods for me. Initially, after that first shock, there were the most changes. So in the communities that I do work in, the gangs like to throw very big uh, Bailey Funk parties. These are uh, parties where they hire DJs. Um, it's free to the public. Anybody can come and they last all night and they sell a lot of uh, a lot of drugs at these parties um, where, you know, usually a few thousand local youth come and spend the night. Well, the pandemic didn't allow them to have those parties for about the first four months. Um, and because this is such a, a huge source of revenue for the gangs, they started gradually coming back with smaller, like more private parties instead of the big public ones. And even then, so that's after four months, so maybe like the last six months they've been doing those. Um, and they've had bigger and bigger parties, but they haven't put them in the same places um, or in the most public, like on the main thoroughfares or in the most public places because they don't want to get a lot of attention by the public authorities to these parties. So they've found ways to continue to sell drugs and make, make money off of the drug trade, um, even as you know lockdowns and all of these sorts of things have been happening around them. In addition, you know some of the people that I talked to said one of the surprising things is that the drug trade really never stopped at all. In fact, a lot more people were, were, were buying. A lot more people weren't going to work and were finding ways to pass their time uh, that could, could occasionally in, include drug use. So certain, a certain amount of demand actually increased for the drugs and police operations decreased. So the, the gangs actually didn't, weren't damaged very badly by the pandemic in the way that maybe some other criminal activities uh, really took a hit, like extortion or uh, you know maybe trafficking because borders were closed. Uh, so I think it really depends on the type of activities, as Juan pointed out, and Cecilia pointed out very well, the types of activities that they were engaging in, whether or not it was really possible to continue to do those and what the demand was like or where they could con continue to, to engage in those, those markets. Thanks, Nick. Um, Philip, did you have anything you want to add or? Sure. Okay. Um, I think I want to add uh, two, two other things uh, sort of working in fairly different directions from each other. 
one is I think um, for for at least for some criminal groups, it's an added dimension to this, which is that often their governance is most uh, strongest or most pronounced in areas that are um, particularly likely to be hit hard by COVID. Um, meaning classically that would be prisons and sort of uh, marginalized, especially sort of peripheral urban communities, right? Where um, and, and you know, as, as is becoming clearer and clearer as COVID drags on, like um, uh, COVID can increase inequality and COVID can really hit uh, the, the poor, the sort of marginalized in society pretty hard. So um, I think that that's not a constant across all criminal groups, but it's certainly a, a consideration for some criminal groups, especially those with real uh, sort of um, uh, strength or concentration in prisons and places like that. And I think that means that um, while there's certainly opportunities up for grabs to expand um, markets and control, um, I remember hearing some fairly early reports out of, I think, um, Salvador, maybe Guatemala, about um, sort of local criminal leaders reading where things were going and saying, look, this is going to hit me and my family and my people pretty hard, right? Like it, it might or might not hit the guys like like closer to like the capital and in the, the middle of town, but it's going to hit my guys hard. So um, as much as sort of enforcing a curfew is a matter of showing your strength and showing your power, there might also be a different kind of pragmatism under there, which is like no one else is going to take care of us, so we've got to do it. Right now, the flip side of that, the part that I said is going to go in the other direction is uh, I think in Mexico for a while there was a suggestion that you know maybe maybe this will keep uh, gunmen and and violent actors pretty busy or preoccupied and will stop them from um, sort of battling for control of new turfs and things. And that certainly has not been the case. Um, there there has been a lot of evidence of um, of sort of often propaganda campaigns followed by violent campaigns to sort of wrest control from different groups. Um, so it's, you know, and that's certainly not just the case of I need to protect my people. That's the case of uh, I can I can make something out of this. Um, but I, I wonder, I don't know if we have enough information on this yet, but I wonder if COVID is going to prove a case within the sort of current world as well as in the legitimate world of um, empowering the powerful and um, strip power away from the more precarious, right? Meaning that um, if you're a big group with an already diversified uh, means of making money, um, if you've got strong government connections and things, you might do really well out of COVID, right? If you're a smaller group with a limited territory, primarily making your money from one or two forms of illicit activity, maybe with a couple of um, you know, government backers, but not a whole uh, a sort of a rich network of connections, you might do really badly, right? That precarity might really uh, set you back. I think one of the things that uh, is talked about a bit in Mexico is that one of the big cartels, the cartel of Jalisco, seems to be on a really aggressive sort of expansion campaign and they were already one of the biggest groups active in Mexico and that seems like it might be a case of um, power taking more power during this time right they were and, and being able to finally sort of muscle out some of the the smaller groups that were very locally entrenched but couldn't re couldn't really be taken over couldn't really expand um, yeah it seems like the, the Jalisco cartel might be using this as an opportunity to sort of weed out some of those smaller groups Yeah, thanks um, all of you. I'm just going to chime in um, and add a few comments based on my own work. Um, I realized I didn't fully introduce myself at the beginning in terms of what I study, but my research focuses on drug trafficking in Central America. Um, and just building off some of the points uh, particularly raised by Philip and Nick at the end that I think are interesting. Um, similar to how Nick mentioned, right, that drug demand has increased uh, in Brazil. The same is true, I believe, in U.S. markets, certainly. Um, I know uh, in many areas I work um, in Honduras, I've heard that while there's been an increase in internal domestic policing and forcing things like curfews related to COVID, right, there's often been a decrease potentially in, say, um, sending the Navy out to intercept or the Coast Guard to intercept drug shipments. And in a lot of these areas, um, I know Philip raised this idea of taking care of one's own and in some of the harder hit, more rural communities, right, where drug revenue is really a key source of income, right, there's certainly been, I think, and in some ways, right, a need for the community to make up other economic losses related to the pandemic by increasing um, drug shipments, as well as just 
right? Good um, criminal market standpoint, taking advantage of the fact that the state resources right now are focused on enforcing things like curfews, right? To be able to be moving a lot more cocaine. Um, so yeah, thank you all of you guys for that. The next question I want to turn to um, was why are criminal organizations engaging in various forms of governance during the pandemic? Um, and I'm also just going to pick up one of the audience questions that's come in because it's related to this about what benefits uh, criminal organizations receive taking on governance in communities. So if anyone wants to jump in and highlight some of those general benefits as well as specifically why during the pandemic we might see this even more. Juan, it looks like. I could start and then we can again do the, get the same. I think we all can like build on each other. Uh, and I, I think this is actually the, one of those very important questions that we have some answers to, but we still need more answers. Why do they govern and how do they govern? Uh, I mean, just do a, a very shameless plug. This is like a project that we're starting with Nick and Laura, uh, um, in particular, because like w it, it's it's fascinating that there's a, it's this great variation in, in how they're governing, and uh, so like trying to understand th this, these differences is, is, is fundamental. And there are some differences, and there's some work that are showing that it has to do with uh, the nature of their illicit markets or where they are in the particular illicit market. So there's a very big difference, and this is towards the research that we hope to do, uh, between governing a rural community here, about 20 miles from where I'm sitting out right now, where there's uh, coca leaf production probably, or and then they're processing this into doing drug cocaine. Uh, that's going to be very different, and the criminal organization that's controlling that particular activity is going to be having very different incentives than the um, the, the the groups that. Laura was looking at in 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 in, in Nicaragua uh, and in, in in Central America, and it's going to be very different from the incentives that groups have in um, in, in Rio, which Nick looked at in in, in, in his research. Uh, so that's one of the answers. Like we have to look at what types of activities they're dealing with, and that has an impact on what type of governance they're doing. So. Um, in my own work in Brazil, I looked at the relationship as to like why do politicians and criminal groups uh, build alliances to influence political outcomes, and it tends to be that it's some of the uh, list, the the criminal organizations that are mostly focused or at least originally in extracting things from their own populations, taxing them, extorting them, that had to build very complex. Uh, organizations that regulated social life because in part in order to extract things from populations you have to have information from them uh, you have to be able to monitor their behavior uh, if you don't have that it will and if that's you don't really need to build the, these very com more complex forms of governance so like it tended to be these groups that extracted from populations that had uh, stronger uh, governance uh, organizations and that kind of sounds like strong like the same similar arguments have been made about the state <laughs> states that needed to extract or uh, from their populations in order to do other things like war tended to be build stronger states so you have similar things going on with criminal organizations as well as well which is very interesting uh, so you you can think about that uh, as one of the reasons why they would do it uh, i think there's another like possibility and, 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 and it's worth exploring and they're they're constructing a Protecting some of these markets requires at least some level of tacit support from populations. And when you have that condition, you'll, you need to give the population something. And most of the times, like what the, what the population wants is some form of order, especially in marginalized areas. And if, if it's the drug trafficking gang that provides that order, well, that creates a sense of, uh, of, of legitimacy. And, and, and towards these uh, or, or of allegiance of loyalty towards these groups. So that brings in, uh, it kind of tells you why they would do this. And that applies again in COVID. If you see the uh, and the case I know very well, Brazil, if you see the Brazilian state being complete disarray or doing absolutely nothing to support marginalized populations in the COVID crisis, well, someone steps in. And in this case, some criminal organizations.
I'm going to encroach in Philip's space a little bit. <laughs> but I think if, if we think about what we have seen during the pandemic, it also has to do a lot of what the media have covered, right? And, and Juan and Nick wrote a great piece uh, for the Urban Violence Research Network about this, right? And, and a lot of it has to do also with what the media has reported about, you know, what criminal groups were doing or not doing during the pandemic. So there's that, I would say, sort of like grain of salt in terms of when we think about what criminal groups are doing in this context, it also is very much related to, to what the media coverage has been. And then as Juan and Nick found out, a lot of the things that were sort of uh, stated at the beginning turned out to be not uh, quite as strong as originally thought. So there's there's that element. I think the other interesting part in terms of this sort of PR that we tend to see from criminal groups, right, for them giving gifts um, around Christmas time or holding Halloween parties, for example, those are not new activities. But I do think that this was a time to also, in a way, change the narrative and take control of it. Because if we think about most of the things that we see from criminal groups in the media have to do with organizational failures, right? So an interdiction, an arrest. So things that clearly did not work out for the organization is the bulk of things that we know from them. And so when we get these sort of glimpses of them, you know, sort of like handing out care packages uh, in some of these communities, it's also a way, I think, of taking control of the narrative. But as, as, as Philip has studied, I think it also has to do a lot with what they want us to see uh, from them. So I don't necessarily think that I mean, I agree with Juan that there is an incentive given the business that you have and what kind of income you need to, you know, to get. But at the same time, I think there has been a lot that has been tied to how media have covered, you know, what criminal groups are doing in this time. And not necessarily that some of these things are so out of the ordinary uh, for them. In terms of the benefits, I would say that what I have seen, uh, it has to do with precluding local populations from engaging with law enforcement. So really having some degree of loyalty from them of like, well, I'm not really going to get any benefits of talking to law enforcement. So these these ideas, not necessarily that they're good criminal groups, but rather that they offer certain benefits, I think has helped them to really stop, uh, you know, how far governments can reach in some of these areas. And so I think one of the benefits is that, that you just limit the interactions that they have with law enforcement and they tend to distrust some of these state institutions. Sorry. Um, so I, I, those are those are really interesting comments by Cecilia and Juan. Um, I guess I guess the way that I think about you know what criminal groups get by providing governance to communities, I I try to think of the the situation of especially the leaders of these groups because they're the ones who are generally deciding what the policy is of the organization itself. How much money are we going to spend, you know, distributing welfare, distributing, uh, you know, uh, resolving disputes in the community, and how much are we going to use violence to control the community? And I think one thing that leaders of these organizations know very well yeah. is that violence will only get you so far. Um, it's far better to have people in your community to, to love you as opposed to just fearing you. And that is going to influence the way that everybody in those communities in which your organization is operating view you and whether or not they are willing to go to the police to inform on a variety of different illegal or criminal activities your group is engaging in. So, you know, I mean, and it, and it is about it is about propaganda and messaging on the one hand, but it also is about actually providing some goods to people. Um, it may not be a ton of welfare. You know, criminal organizations are not interested necessarily in redistribution of wealth. But those people who are hurting in the community, if you can be seen to be providing goods to them or throwing parties and giving, you know, free food and drink, that goes a long, long way, especially in neighborhoods where a lot of people are struggling financially. So I think that the benefits are multiple. Uh, you know, it's about not wanting 
people to inform on you to the police. But it's also if everybody in those neighborhoods, lo you know, loves the organization or has a certain amount of respect for the organization, that increases the longevity of that organization for sure. Um, and their ability to maintain control of that area against rivals, against the state, against whoever may want to infringe on their uh, their business. It also helps in developing maybe political capital. So a lot of criminal organizations develop relationships with political parties or politicians. And the more that those communities support those gangs, cartels, mafias, and they can translate that into votes and political power that can only help those groups. So I think that there are a lot of benefits to, to organizations engaging in these sorts of activities. Like uh, Bo Sicilian once said, um, I, I don't know if, you know, I think the jury is still out on how much the pandemic has led these groups to increase those sorts of activities. For sure, you know, there were a, a lot of photos, at least initially, about, you know, criminal groups handing out boxes of like goods with like their name printed on it. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure that they uh, have continued those practices or that wasn't just like a photo opportunity. I, d I don't think we know that yet. Um, I don't think it has really changed the, the calculus. I think most of these organizations are engage have, have been engaging in that sort of thing for a long time. Um, and that's, that's not anything new. You know, they may increase it some as they're, the communities in which they're operating are struggling. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, the state's not providing it and therefore we're going to provide it. Um, although it, it may get them, ca you know, some extra social and political capital. I'll leave it there. Uh, I'm going to echo something uh, Cecilia said because she got in on my turf. Um, and I think like we do have to be careful to to not mistake the packaging of of public action for the sort of underlying uh, dynamic, right? So kind of like Cecilia was saying, like um, distributing face masks or, or hand sanitizer or even like food and, and diapers and things might be uh, sort of speaking to the reality today in times of COVID, but it's a it's a practice that's there anyway. In better times, it's Christmas and Halloween parties. In worse times, it's like care packages and things. Um, so that I think some of the the sort of more sensational headlines talking about like or like criminal groups are using COVID is like well criminal groups will use whatever they can use right and the underlying practice remains the same that if there is a benefit to be had and it's a relatively cost effective one why wouldn't you go for it um that's that's also just good like you know sort of propaganda or or, or spin right for for businesses or for governments don't don't make up a completely new truth speak to what people are already talking about um Mexico has um subnational elections happening this year and i'm almost sure that part of what we'll see in like narco messaging and criminal propaganda as elections approach won't it might still have some COVID content but we'll see a shift of people talking about uh, electoral candidates and things right it's that's a reflection on communication talking back to the society about what the society talks about and gaining legitimacy on those terms um, and i think the other thing i was going to say and this is to the the question from the audience about um, benefits of governance is that I think we need to be cautious about assuming that public action or public distribution of anything is necessarily a public good and not um, a sort of older form of patronage, right? Like we like the sort of old school classic studies of organized time, crime are all about um, the way criminal actors give out gifts and do you favors. But you're indebted because of that, right? Like the the local like strong man will like do you a favor and help you out, get your like car out of the pound or whatever. But then you owe the guy, uh, and the, and the debt is not one that's easy to repay. So I think even sort of what seems like open distribution of like boxes of of stuff going out to the local community doesn't necessarily come without uh, an obligation attached to it. Um, and it's, and certainly I think you know even the cases that look the most like public goods, like Nick mentioned, like a criminal act of sort of building a football field uh, in Mexico. There's been cases of like medical clinics being built. Um, that's only a public good if anyone can access it, right? And a, a medical clinic that 
you can only get into if you're on the list with the guys who built it is not really a public good, right? That's patronage and that's um, organized crime um, building power by building these sort of like networks of obligation throughout society, right? Um, so I think that's that's really important. Like, do criminal actors benefit from just like giving stuff to everyone and making life better for everyone? Maybe sometimes, but they definitely benefit from uh, creating individuals and, and communities that are deeply indebted to them. So I've got a yelling cat. It's just looking for things to break behind me. Uh, I'll leave it there. Um, I was going to jump in quickly. I think that's a really key point that Philip just emphasized, right? We talk a lot about particularly in criminal governance in the context of how these groups interact with communities, um, of their providing things that, yeah, on the surface seem like public goods. I know um, in Central American context as well, though, Right, they may right the soccer stadium, the softball stadium, um, what have you, may seem like it's available to everyone, right? But it comes with a very strong, um, doesn't even need to be said implication, right? That that means that the community will um, not report right on illicit activity happening, right? Will guard the the secrets of the specific criminal organization operating there. Um, so not exactly a public good. Uh, I know Nick, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to to maybe have a, another explanation for why criminal groups might distribute benefits to, to, to members of the community. And that is that a lot of these individuals are from the community in which they are operating. So they have extensive social and familial networks in those neighborhoods or rural communities where they're living. And there may be a certain amount of social obligation involved. If you're doing better in that community, it's just an expectation that you're willing to, to give a little back. And so, you know, I think that gets us a little away from like this extremely cynical uh, gang member or, or member of a criminal group who's only interested in accumulating power and wealth and placing them more in the context in which the vast majority of criminals are actually operating. And that is on a very low level. Uh, you know, they're, they get involved when they're generally young teenagers in most cases. Um, and the lifespan for a, a great many of them is not very long or they're gonna end up in prison very quickly. Um, so I, I think it's important to remember that, you know, by decontextualizing and talking about criminal groups in like this sort of abstract way, we get a, a maybe much more the vision from the top. And if you look at it as to like the actual behavior on the ground, it's, it's a lot more complex than that. They are relating to local people, you know, friends, family members, community members, in in relatively normal ways that anybody in those communities would be interacting with other people except they you know are engaging in a in a, a very insecure market um and so you know i think thinking about it at different levels of the organization is also important i think just to give an example of what nick was saying just he just reminded me of one of my interviews um you know the person was talking about uh um, fuel theft in Mexico and how gas stations don't really sell full gallons of gasoline to to customers. They sell a little bit more, but they tell you that you you bought a gallon, right? And they basically make a profit like that. And this person said to me, like, I know they're stealing from me, but I still go because there's a personal relationship. And so he, as a customer, was fully aware that he was not buying full gallons every time he went to this place. But at the same time, he felt that he had to go because there were other ties uh, that brought them together and so this was part of just you know their interaction and a you know what he saw as a minor cost uh, that he had to um, you know to pay for other relationships and other benefits that he gets from those ties so just to to illustrate a little bit what Nick was saying Yeah, I think um, both Nick and Cecilia now have raised really good, important nuance to this. I know as well in my own research, I've heard, 
cases of a specific trafficker who's given back extensively in the community saying, well, I'm the one who, you know, had opportunities to do so, right? So if you're the guy who makes it big, whether it's trafficking cocaine or oil theft or whatever criminal activity we're talking about, right, um, your family and friends and your community, right, is going to probably put some kind of social pressure on you or there'll be some expectation, right, that at least some of that wealth will be shared. Um, since we only have 10 minutes left, I want to get to one of the last questions. Um, do you believe the pandemic will have lasting implications on how organized crime operates? Um, and we've also gotten an audience question specifically asking if we think it'll impact um, money, um, whether it'll weaken the money making avenues for criminal organizations. Anyone? Is it just going to keep being business as usual? I don't have any thoughts on whether it's going to have lasting implications. Uh, I, I saw Philip. Philip, so. yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, um, I think, I think in the, in the case of Novest in Mexico, there might there might really be a difference. The criminal landscape might look different after COVID has sort of started to recede, if it starts to recede, as opposed to before. But I don't think that's down to just which cartel or gang or anything gets it right. I think um, part of the problem there is, you know, uh, there has been a lot of violence and a lot of like very sort of public um, crime and a lot of public like sensationalized reporting of crime for the last uh, decade and a half. Um, and and not much sense of what can improve things and and no consistent strategy on how to fix things except for this sort of background idea that things were better when a couple of big cartels ran the complete show and they kept to themselves and they kept a lot of peace within their sort of borders right so um to the extent that covid might be a case of some powerful criminal actors being able to consolidate their control I think I've seen some people suggest that, you know, this this might actually really benefit a few cartels. And if you see um, violence sort of decreasing after COVID, um, don't expect that to be so much a case of like, oh, they, they won the COVID battle and expect it to be more a case of, you know, like the state and the government wouldn't complain if one criminal actor was dominant and uh, as a result could sort of keep violence on the down low a bit. Um, there's been, you know, some suggestion that might be happening in Salvador with the government sort of uh, informally allowing the um, the major uh, martyrs or gangs to sort of uh, control their turf, but to keep it out of the newspapers, right? So th there, I think there is a possibility that while while COVID might be just one more opportunity in a lot of ways, it might actually reconfigure some things. But that's much more because of how the state and crime are interacting, and not because of how um, COVID and crime are interacting necessarily. Can I just complete the Mexico sort of like round of examples and then you guys can <laughs> jump in. Um, I think what we have seen is also some reports of some new criminal opportunities. And then the question is really how long lasting these are, right? So we're seeing reports of uh, counterfeit of uh, protective equipment that is widely used right now. And also some reports that of um, counterfeit vaccines uh, are circulating. So of course, these should be um, a concern for governments in terms of you know paying attention to those. So these these are new forms of criminality, but the question then becomes you know how long lasting can can they be? I think the other question in terms of Mexico is um, because the Mexican government has not really provided stimulus uh, you know checks or income like other countries have done. I think it's raising questions about recruitment possibilities and not to draw a direct line between low income and necessarily a criminal path, but I think it has raised concerns about like, well, some people who have either lost their jobs or have lost a significant amount of their income, is this going to create opportunities for some of these criminal groups to to recruit members uh, for some of their activities? And so, you know, we still don't have an answer about that, but I think uh, I think these are important questions that, you know, in the years to come, we'll have answers for. Um, I think uh, Cecilia raised a very important point uh, in her first intervention. I think she said that we've seen 
similar things happened in the past, kind of these exogenous shocks changing a little bit the landscape in which these uh, groups operate. You mentioned the Great Recession, and I, I think there might be something similar going on. There's some changes in some illicit markets or who's what their market, what their uh, what their main source of revenue is and stuff. But like, I don't think there's like a fundamental change uh, in, in in like the governance aspect to it. I I think there's other more important uh, factors behind the, the the criminal governance. And I think uh, Nick, Phil, and, and and Cecilia have mentioned that there's all these. Um, the importance of the state and the relationship between organizations that that hasn't changed, <laughs> at least in the countries that we look at. If anything, uh, it has provided for better opportunities for this relationship to develop in a, in other in other directions. So I I think there's like some elements that are that already changed in the past and have nothing to do with with, with COVID. Um, my biggest the example I have in my head is like the way that the criminal uh, governance aspect of the city of Rio de Janeiro changed dramatically, not because of COVID. It had already happened before in a great part of the city where uh, another criminal organization that has nothing well, originally now very much involved with the drug trade, but that had uh, evolved from like these protection rackets or paramilitary like structures. They took over most of the city now. Uh, at least a lot of the parts of the marginalized and it had nothing to do with COVID and it had a lot of do, to do with politics and I think there was a question here about uh, other aspects that had nothing to do with uh, economics that deal with criminal governance it had a lot to do with the politics of Rio de Janeiro which happens to be a city where political parties are almost non-existent and at least functionally non-existent like they exist in paper uh, so they the, the, the political landscape of the city it, it permitted for the emergence of uh, a sort of alliance between certain politicians and emerging uh, criminal groups that now controlled a big part of the city and controlled the politics of the city itself too, at least a, a big, uh, a considerable part of the city. Uh, so I think these other things that had uh, uh, permitted criminal governance to exist are still around and what we're seeing with COVID is maybe changes that affect um, probably uh, just like short term things. Um, yeah, I would say, like most of the other panelists, I don't see the pandemic as being like the, the thing that radically transforms uh, illicit markets or criminal organizations, at least in Latin America. Um, you know, I, they're definitely impacted by the COVID pandemic, but I, I see some of the transformations that are occurring are much more are much longer term. And they have a lot to do with, you know, the international drug trade as well as like within states, uh, not just inequality on an economic level, but lack of political and civil rights for a lot of people. You know, they can't go to the state to resolve a lot of their problems. So you're going to turn to other types of organizations or social movements within society. And it just so happens that, you know, in a lot of neighborhoods, um, that's going to be that's going to be a, a gang or a cartel or a militia or a vigilante group uh, and it's not going to be the state and I think those problems are not new uh, to Latin America or much of the developing world or even places in the United States um, and these problems are not I don't see them getting better uh, in fact we're probably going in the in the opposite direction over the last you know few decades so um, you know, the pandemic is is transforming things, but it's, I don't think the changes are, are going to be as long lasting as some of these other political and economic forces. We are sadly out of time. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and providing such great insight on these issues. Um, thank you to audience members for listening in and to those of you who submitted questions. Um, and yeah, just, this has been a great discussion. I look forward to continuing the discussion with all of you, um, not on this panel anymore. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Thanks.